with that, I think I'll get started with our panelists uh, and just briefly introduce them. Um, we have Deborah uh, Greaves from the, she's the head of engineering and computing math, um, mathematics at the University of Plymouth. Um, and she's here from Super John as well. And Ignacio, have you been able to join us yet? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Oh, good morning or good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if you had some technical difficulties. Thanks, Thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Um, he's had a division of wind energy materials and components at DTU and executive secretary of IWEA um, in wind TCP. I'm doing very short intros. You guys are welcome to add to them when you, when you start your conversations as well. Um, and John uh, Tande, Director of Northwind and Chief Scientist at Sintef. Hopefully I said that correctly. And then finally, we have Paul Beers from NREL, who, as I mentioned earlier, we work very closely with in a number of different uh, capacities. And Paul's here to share with us um, some of the work that he's doing at NREL and uh, that NREL's doing across the board in offshore wind. So with that, why don't we get started with Deborah? And I'm gonna pull up your presentation, Deborah. hopefully without too much difficulty. <laughs> Bear with me one second. <clears throat> Excuse me, hold on. Corey, do you think you can pull it up because it's a PDF and I'm having trouble with it? <clears throat> yeah, no problem. Thank you. There we go. Thanks so much. No problem. Hey. Great. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, um, Carrie. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come and speak today. And, um, and uh, it's very nice to be here, so thank you for that. I, I'd like to give a, um, an overview of, of the work of the Offshore Renewable Energy Hub, Supergen. Um, so you've already introduced me and, and I'm based in the University of Plymouth in the UK, uh, but I'm also the director for the uh, Supergen ORE Hub. So next slide, please. And this hub is a, a, a project over four years, which is funded by the EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. Um, and it's a nine million pound programme and it's a consortium programme, but it also aims to provide research leadership in offshore renewable energy and connect together people working in academia, industry, uh, policy and public and so on. So next slide, please. Um, so within that, we want to inspire research. We have a research programme which is um, built on a set of priorities through consultation with uh, the sector. And we want to connect people together so they find out about the research and they also help to direct the research where it's uh, most appropriate and most needed. We also want to grow our uh, international collaboration and uh, interdisciplinary collaborations as well. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so one perhaps key difference here is that we are um, in offshore renewable energy. We're including within that offshore wind as well as wave and tidal um, stream energy. So next slide, please. Um, and this brings together uh, supergen hubs that were previously run separately for, for wind and for marine, which um, we, we categorise uh, as wave and tidal energy. So. This is a different uh, system and it's bringing together all of offshore wind with wave and tidal research. Um, and the reason for doing that is that we see a lot of synergy between the different technologies and their, um, their, their uh, operation within the marine environment. So many of the research challenges can actually be um, transferred between the, the uh, offshore wind, wave and tidal. Nevertheless, they are of course at very different um, stages of development and offshore wind is, is uh, very fully commercialized. Uh, a tidal stream energy is earlier in its, its development and wave energy is, is earlier still. 
So this is a map of the UK and it shows, uh, dotted around it, shows the, the consortium members for the offshore uh, renewable energy hub and the logos of the universities are on the right hand side. So there are 10 universities uh, in, the, in the core consortium of the hub. Uh, next page, please. And here they are. So within the team, you may know some of these people and uh, we have a range of expertise across disciplines and people working in different sectors across offshore uh, wind, wave and tidal. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have, as well as our academic consortium, we have a very strong uh, advisory board composed of um, uh, industry and uh, innovation bodies, government um, and academia. And uh, the advisory board sort of operates quite independently from the hub and provides um, sort of steering and uh, guidance to, to the hub. So it's, it's a really valuable um, part of our structure. Next page, please. Um, so what we're trying to do within the, 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 the hub is to, uh, is to inspire research and connect people together, as I've said. And the hub itself is a nine million pound programme. And within that, we have um, a set of core research, a core research programme, which is a, a small amount of the total research that's going in the UK on offshore renewable energy. We also have um, a, an amount of funds that we can use for uh, flexible funding. So we're putting out a series of calls for research and we fund um, smaller research projects within that. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more research in the UK and this diagram is sort of showing that um, part of our role is to is to present that research and promote that research and communicate it across to the people on the right hand side, the stakeholders, public, government, industry and other organisations as well. Um, and one of our key tools for doing this is through the research landscape. And you can have a look on our website and, and see this. I just want to give you a brief demo of how that works. So if you go to the next page, um, yeah, there will be some links. Oh, it's blocked, is it? Okay, I'll, I'll have a look at that question in a minute. Um, so if you go to our website um, and then click on the research landscape, go to the next page. There's quite a few to flip through here. Um, it's a sort of um, interactive uh, visual tool and uh, on the left hand side, we've got a series of eight research themes and within each of those themes, there are research challenges. So we've done a lot of work consulting with the community, academic and industry and others working in the sector to identify what the research challenges are and what the priorities are. <clears throat> and we present them here. So if you go to the next slide, if we can, if we click on one of these, any of these themes, then a number of buttons will appear across the landscape of ORE and each of those buttons has got a research challenge. So if you click on one of those, go to the next page, um, then you'll see an information board comes up on the right hand side. And here uh, we've summarised a set of information about each of those research challenges. And if you go to the next page um, and carry on, you can find more information. And then if you click on this button, you can the delve deeper button then you can go uh, further into the, the detail about that sorry uh, you could go back one um, then that takes you through to links to live research projects and also um, PhD students um, and um, and research papers as well so uh, there's also an invitation there to contribute your own project so it's supposed to be a, a sort of live document which is a way of promoting and communicating the research that's going on in the UK. Okay, so uh, that's our research landscape. If we go to the next page, this summarises um, the core research programme. Unfortunately, as a PDF, it doesn't sort of click through in the way I was hoping it would, but anyway, it's all there for you to see now. Um, and you can see that the, the research programme is a, a sort of integrated set of um, five different work programmes, sorry, work packages. Uh, work package one, is a demonstration of scenario. So it's setting up as, as the, um, the, the aspirational systems of the future for offshore renewable energy. And our program is really um, targeted around thinking about what are, the, um, what are the aspirational systems for offshore wind and for wave energy and for tidal stream, and what are the technical challenges that are needed in order to unlock that, and what's the underpinning research needed to do that. 
Um, so that starts off by setting the scene and then work package two um, looks at sites and conditions. So here what we're trying to do is put together a series of sets of information and data from a number of sites. So they, those might be real sites or they might be demonstration sites uh, which are collecting data. They might be real operational uh, offshore farms or they could be synthetic sites, um, set up set of data that can be used for test beds. And the idea is that we share this data and then uh, people can use that to test their, um, their, their research. And the sort of data we have is met ocean data, uh, wind data, and also seabed uh, and environmental data. So all that is, is being collected. Then we go into work package three, which is about modeling, uh, developing modeling tools, improving the modeling tools, and in particular, looking at um, the different, very different scales of those modeling tools. If you think about offshore wind uh, from the blade resolved models um, through to uh, regional scale or, or um, into array scale and then regional scale and then you know, large scale simulations. Um, and what we're trying to do there is think about how those different scales of modeling uh, interact with one another. What, what are the key physics that need to be transferred between each model? And then also how do you include within it um, the ecological uh, effects as well? So thinking about the impact of the, of the ORE on its environment. Um, then the next work package four is looking at design, particularly looking at uh, cost reduction and how design can be used um, to uh, make our designs less conservative and, and uh, less costly. Um, and, and then going to work package five, looking at um, floating futures. So here we're particularly looking at concepts and, and uh, innovations. What are the limitations for different types of uh, offshore wind and other offshore renewable energy concept and how might, how might those be overcome? So that's the sort of the framework for the, for the core research program. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, so there's a link there that you can find out more about our core research. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Then I mentioned the flexible funding. So we have about three million pounds of funding that we're putting out through, is through a, a series of calls and we call this flexible funding. And we're supporting a number of projects and I've just put, put those on the UK map as well. So you can see how uh, further distributed that funding is. Then we go to the next slide. Um, there's a uh, well, there, yes, there's a, there's a couple of quotes there from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult um, who have worked with us to support um, some of those flexible funding rounds. We've allocated um, 2.2 million so far in 22 projects that are already underway. We're in the middle of just allocating our next round, which is just under a million pounds worth of uh, research projects that will be announced in the next month or so. Uh, and then the next page, please. Um, this is a, I won't go through all of these, but this is a, a snapshot of the projects that have been funded through the Flex Flexible Fund. And if we go to the next page, um, then we're also supporting an early career research network. So we have a suite of uh, events and activities and training program um, that supports our early career researchers. And these are typically uh, postdocs or end of uh, last year of a PhD and the first couple of years of an academic uh, role. Uh, and we have some funding to support uh, the ECR community as well. Next page, please. Um, then you can see plotted on here um, the projects and the, and the researchers who've been supported through the ECR Research Fund. And all of those uh, projects and, and funds are reported on, on the website through the links I've put in this presentation. Um, next slide. And there's the list of projects funded by the ECR fund. Um, next slide, please. Um, other things we're doing is, is thinking about uh, equality, diversity and inclusion and um, how we can improve that within our sector. We've uh, published a, a scoping report recently. Next slide, please. And we also do outreach and engagement with the wider community hands-on activities for kids and, and families. Next page, please. Sorry, I know I'm racing through, but I don't. I want to make sure everyone else has time to talk as well. Uh, we've 
developed a, a roadmap for wave energy. So that's also downloadable from the website. And the next page, please. Uh, and we also have a, a facilities map. Um, so for the UK, uh, research facilities for, um, for research in offshore uh, renewable energy. You can, you can find information about each of those on the website. And then the next page, please. Right, there we are. So please do uh, get in touch if you'd like to find out more. There's lots of information um, on the website and um, we're very keen to, to engage. We, we have an international program and uh, we do a lot of collaboration. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, and just to mention, uh, I said this at the start, uh, I've gotten uh, a few questions, but if any of our uh, participants have a question, please send it in. And when uh, at the end, we'll, we'll take a few. I already have a few for you, Deborah, that just came in. So hopefully that's, yeah. we'll, we'll have time for those uh, in just a little bit. Right, so Ignacio, do you want to uh, go next? Would that be all right? Yes. And I don't believe you have slides, is that right? I didn't, I didn't see any, I just wanna make well, sure. I do. I do. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, send it to you. I can share my screen if that's correct. Excellent. That's, that's, that's fine. fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's do that then. And fingers crossed everything will work. Yeah. We had a little and trouble at the start. So sorry, but hopefully. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That should be okay. I guess that you can see uh, the screen now, full screen mode, right? Okay. You're all set. So, perfect. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. First of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, really exciting to know about the, the news in the US. Fantastic initiatives, all your activities there. So, and also really keen to see progress in the coming years uh, out of all these uh, projects that you have uh, initiated. So, um, so it is great. So let me show um, some of the activities we are developing at DTU with Energy. We are the Technical University of Denmark, uh, and I'm representing here the Department for Wind Energy. I'm Ignacio Marti, as, as it has been uh, uh, mentioned in the beginning, and I'm leading one of the divisions. Uh, but let me take you through the slides to explain uh, how we work and, and, and to give you a little bit of an overview of our activities. So. Um, the Department for Wind Energy in DTU, we are around 260 uh, staff and, and we have a, a particularity here, something I think it is a special, which is the fact that we are dedicated, fully dedicated to wind energy. So all the department, it is uh, focused on, on wind and you can see, yeah, it is also that we work close to with industry. You will see some of our projects later. And we also are proud of, of our international research collaboration. And, all the organizations participating here today presenting, we are working with uh, one way or another in different projects. And, and of course, we are very keen to collaborate with uh, further with, uh, with the US uh, colleagues as well. So we are working, uh, if you start from the right side, uh, from the very small scale composite materials and mechanics, we have activities there, sections. Typically, each one of our sections is 25 uh, researchers, 30, depends. Uh, so we start from the small scale, then we also combine, of course, our, our modeling activities together with testing with laboratories, um, is the verification of our tools, what, what makes them uh, valuable and, and, and strong. Then we move from materials scale, nanoscale to the structures where we deal with blades, we deal with bearings, we also have uh, blade test facilities and bearing test facilities. We have um, colleagues working in the aerodynamic design of, of, of the blades, also developing uh, fluid mechanics, computational fluid dynamic tools that, that we develop and validate also in our, in our wind tunnel. And then we have some other colleagues that are working on the loads, control, our elasticity, um, typically some design tools uh, that I will present a little bit later. Then if we move, so this, we are going into the bigger scale. We are at the, at the scale of the wind turbine here. We started at the micro nano scale. Then this is the wind turbine scale. We move to the system scale. We are also working uh, on, on the grid side uh, and the systems engineering. And we have some of our colleagues working at the really meso scale, planetary scale with some of our, our meteorological tools there. So we have a, um, we are organized in three divisions, uh, which are grouping these sections that you see here in, uh, in the upper part. And we also have some horizontal activities where universities, so we have education and training, 
and, uh, and we also do research-based consultancy and tests for industry. But let me go uh, a little bit more in detail, uh, presenting what we do in each one of these divisions. So in the resource assessment uh, section, we have different, different tools that go from uh, turbulence on the, 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 the turbulent scale, let's say a small scale, to the mesoscale, regional scale, that we can do resource assessment even to the global scale. We have this global wind atlas that we have developed for the World Bank uh, that is now covering the full world. Um, and it's used for, for um, the initial steps when you are planning a, a wind farm. That goes for onshore and offshore. Then we, are, we have also our colleagues that are working in, in wind field measurements, are developing, uh, for example, LIDAR technology. We have developed the, the wind scanner, which, it, it, which it is a 3D scanning system. Uh, then we have on the system design, our flagship tool is Top Farm, which is about um, layout optimization for um, onshore and offshore wind, uh, wind farms, including now lately floating. So you can take into account different, um, different parameters for the optimization. Uh, so you end up with an optimized cost of energy. Now we are developing the hybrid, uh, the optimization for hybrid systems. And, and in the future, it will include something on power to X as well. On the grid side, it is about topology, different topologies for offshore, including HVDC, um, we also focus on the grid codes, uh, compliance, uh, grid services, ancillary services, blackout starts, things like that. Uh, we have a long-term collaboration with NSOE, which is the, the organization of transmission and system operators in Europe. And, uh, and now a, a section that has been reinforced recently on, on society, market, and policy. If we move to the next division, which is wind turbine design division, this is one of the classic ones, I would say, together with meteorology. This, this, some of these colleagues have started 40 years ago and, and they have been uh, developing since then uh, tools and um, on, for example, on, on wind turbine blades um, um, where we have a, a range of activities, airflow design, aerodynamic control, uh, validation, and the CFD tools that I mentioned before, where we are um, uh, focusing on the small scale, uh, coupled with the aerodynamic tools uh, as well and elasticity tools, and in particular free st fluid structure interaction, which is crucial for, for floating wind, as you know. Then and the tur turbine response and control, it is a combination of elasticity, hydrodynamics, waves, wave modeling as well, control and the validation of, of all these tools. And then on, on measurements, um, we do have a, a, a experimental site for prototypes, uh, two sites in Denmark where we are testing prototypes of different companies. And of course, we also have um, uh, teams that are working with the instrumentation of loads, um, uh, noise, um, energy quality, etc. So if we move to the last um, division, it is the division I'm leading. It is wind energy materials and components. Here we focus on, we come back to the small scale on the composites. Uh, we characterize new materials uh, for industry. Um, we focus on uh, composite mechanics, for example, NDT, non-destructive technologies to characterize the materials also during the manufacturing processes. Uh, we have a strong focus now, for example, on linear erosion where we have several projects uh, running blade repair methods. And then when we move a little bit uh, bigger scale, um, this is the, 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 the section working on manufacturing and testing. We have now um, a new facility to manufacture blades, full blades, uh, small blades, let's say up to 15 meter long. But uh, the purpose here is to try innovative solutions, materials, manufacturing processes, and we also have laboratories for the small scale for the fibers and the matrix, uh, X-ray tomography, etc. The structural design it is focused on getting the structures efficient. Also, how to test the blades in an efficient uh, way to minimize the, the, the time it takes and the cost. And then the, um, the structural integrity and loads assessment. This section is, is focused on remaining life and life assessment and life extension for key components when they are operating. And now let me take you quickly through um, some examples. I think it is the best way to illustrate what we are doing. And the focus in the, in the coming years, of course, is going to be given by the projects we have now. 
So I will start, it's gonna be quick, and sorry, maybe it's a little bit too quick, but it is just to give you an overview of things, right? So the first one I'm presenting here is, uh, it's called Relia Blade. This is about building a digital twin of a, of a blade. We are working here with the main, uh, some of the main wind turbine manufacturers and, and uh, some operators as well, uh, companies like IBM. So we combine here sensors, material modeling, damage propagation, uh, testing of the blades for the verification of these tools, and then putting everything under a framework provided by IBM where, where all these things connect uh, real time as well. So this is one of the projects. Another project from blades. This is ab about manufacturing, and this is potentially could be a concept to, uh, to make blades uh, much faster. It's, it's, a, it's a modular uh, manufacturing of blades. You, you, you manufacture preforms that you put together later, and then uh, it could save a lot of time. Um, so it's, it's a way to accelerate blade manufacturing, for example, this, this project. Another project, um, it is on life extension and life assessment. We have used, we have been lucky because we got access to the, 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 a, a big set of blades from an offshore wind farm that was the commission in Denmark that had been operating for around 20 years. And now we are analyzing what is the remaining life of those blades. And then, uh, then um, the, let's say validate our tools for life assessment that could be used in a, in a, in a prognosis way uh, for blades operating offshore as well. In all these projects, you see different partners, uh, all of them with industry. Uh, this, this one is about um, developing the, a new way to test blades quicker, uh, faster, and more uh, accurate or more close to what the reality is and not so simplified way, which of course will help us to understand uh, what is the, the um, the degradation of the blades or all the, the loading uh, that you can expect from a blade operating in an offshore wind farm under weight conditions, under a number of uh, events that will, will appear there. Another project, this, this is, now I forget about, um, so I leave behind the blades and I focus more on, on the design part of what we do. We are focusing now a lot with uh, on probabilistic design and this is about um, to really get, try to get rid of the conservatism in the design and all the, the, the safety factors that are taken by the manufacturers that are of course adding weight and cost. So we expect that we can reduce LCOE by 2% onshore and maybe 5% offshore if we move from a deterministic conservative design to a probabilistic one. Here we're working with uh, Best Assess Manufacturer, Osted, Holborg University. Um, Another one on, on um, probabilistic methods, it is the recently approved project uh, Hyperwind, Horizon 20, uh, 2020 still. Um, and this is about um, reduction in risk and uncertainty that will uh, improve the overall design, both of the wind turbine and the wind farm. Um, you see here, if we focus on, or if we think about floating wind, uh, we, we believe that uh, a probabilistic design of floating wind turbines um, will be able to reduce, again, the, the cost. So we take into account, we play a lot with uncertainties, we calculate uncertainties over all the, the modeling chain uh, from the, 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 the wind itself to the loads, uh, and then we put it in a probabilistic context. If we focus now on floating wind, uh, a recently approved project also in, in Europe, it is a flagship where we are going to demonstrate a 11 megawatt floating offshore wind turbine uh, in Norway, um, where the, the, the focus here, of course, it is to get uh, to validate design tools, to instrument that, uh, and then use all this knowledge to uh, design what it could be the uh, five megawatt floating wind farm of the future that we will design in in three places with the knowledge acquired from, from this uh, project. Another project on floating wind, it is, uh, it is focused, it's also, it's gonna be a demonstrator. In this case, it is a Stisdale Technologies um, where we are going to validate our hydro, aero, hydro, servolastic tools for floating wind turbines. Um, and that includes some of our key tools like Hawk 2, for example. And then another project on floating wind that we have active at the moment, it is about the demonstration of, it is an innovative concept that you can see here in this picture. Um, 
and again, it is an opportunity for us. Every time we participate in one of these projects, we learn and we improve our design tools. So it will be another opportunity to, to, to get our design tool hog to uh, more accurate for a floating wind. And then the, uh, this project focus on this, uh, now this part of the presentation focuses on farm control, uh, which is another hot topic. This, this is another European project where we are working with a number of companies and there is a, uh, the catapult that has been mentioned before is also a partner here. And this is about maximize the life cycle profitability of a wind power plant through the control, advanced control strategies. And this includes from uh, LIDAR instrumentation and uh, information through, uh, at the end, closed loop uh, approaches to uh, optimize the, the, the wind farm control. Another project on farm control that we have, it is about improving the individual wind farm wind turbine control if we want to optimize the full power plant operation. And um, yeah, here we are developing uh, optimal derating strategies. Uh, we are calculating the load impact and of course minimize that. Uh, so we are able to predict uh, efficiently if, we, if, if you adopt a control strategy, what is the impact in your, in your wind turbines? And then finally, well, uh, this is a tool that we are developing continuously for uh, optimization of this uh, farm layout with a number of elements here and parameters that are part of this optimization. And just to finalize um, some new facilities that we are developing, uh, like this ACDC lab for wind integration that is gonna be part of our portfolio soon. And I'm not gonna go through this, but I will leave the presentation so you can distribute later. You have a, a here kind of a map of, of the tools we have and how they are linked with some of the projects we have uh, at the moment. So I will stop here. Uh, so we have time for, for, for questions uh, later. Great, thank you so much. There is there a, quite a bit going on at DTU. <laughs> wow, that's, that's impressive. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed at how much, and you packed a lot in a short amount of time, so I really appreciate it. So John, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have uh, you, you join us next and, and um, as I mentioned, you're the new, the director of the newly formed Northwind, I, I believe, right? So maybe you can tell us a bit about that as well uh, as you get going. And I, I should mention, and I'll ask our other speakers if we have a, mo a chance. Um, we did have one question come through. Might be difficult to do, but if you could just comment, John, maybe on what your, um, really the number one priority is you think. You know, you might have 20 projects, but is there an area of focus that really is of significant concern, uh, either from a timing standpoint or necessity? A couple people asked that. So maybe that'll give you a chance, for you and Paul, a chance to highlight your thoughts on that. Yeah. Please. Thank you. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, uh, do you like to share my presentation or? Yeah. yeah, I think it's coming up, so. Perfect. Just one second, We're navigating. Yep. So it's been great to hear all the other presentations now, and I'm really amazed about uh, everything that's going on. Um, and of course, Northwin is a new, a new center that is just starting. It hasn't really started yet, even. It will start this summer. It was just granted by the Research Council in Norway. Um, and we are now uh, preparing the consortium agreement with all the industry partners and so on too. So we'll formally start this summer, but I can tell a bit about our plans and the research program we have and, uh, and, and the setup of this uh, program. <clears throat> And uh, a Northwin, uh, it says on this slide there, FME, Northwin, and FME is a Norwegian uh, short name for a flagship uh, program that is granted by the Research Council of Norway. So it's really the most prestigious um, programs that the Research Council of Norway is, is funding. And it is uh, what we can call a virtual center. So it's a collaboration between uh, some research uh, and centers and universities in Norway um, to form a research center uh, that will exist for a limited period of time 
eight years uh, to solve some specific challenges. And we will do that uh, together with industry. Uh, and I have been, uh, yeah, uh, sort of the uh, um, very active in establishing the center. And I will also be the director of the center. And at the same time, I will also continue my job as a chief scientist at Sintef. So uh, the center will be hosted uh, at Sintef, at Sintef also. It will have a budget of about 350 million Norwegian krona over the eight years period. Uh, if you divide that by 10, more or less, you have the amount in dollars or, or euros, more or less. So it's a fairly substantial program and it comes on top of uh, a number of projects we have uh, ongoing on the side at, at Sintef and at the other uh, research partners. Um, uh, so the research partners that are joining this center together with Sintef is uh, Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology, NTNU. Please, uh, please stay on the first page. Uh, and it's the University of Oslo. And then it's the Norwegian Geotechnical University Institute and the Norwegian Institute of Nature uh, Research. <clears throat> okay, so um, yes, please uh, go to the next slide. So why uh, did we uh, did we start this center? And uh, and there I've. I think this is for some of you quite obvious, for others it's maybe a bit uh, of news value in this. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, in Europe, uh, there are big plans to develop uh, offshore wind. A couple of years ago, we in Europe uh, launched tuition to have 450 gigawatt offshore wind in Europe. So compared to 20 something today, it's quite, uh, a significant increase in installed capacity of offshore wind. Uh, and then uh, late last year, the European Commission um, came up with a strategy plan to have 300 gigawatts of offshore wind in Europe. Uh, and then if you include UK and Norway, which is not part of the European Union, it's close to a 450 gigawatt vision. So it is quite a push to develop a large offshore wind farms uh, in Europe. And uh, that very much sets the research agenda on offshore wind. You need to, to lower the cost of offshore wind and you need to also to find uh, solutions to connect and operate um, systems with large amounts of offshore wind. And you need to develop these kind of offshore grids that you can see on the uh, left-hand side of this slide. Uh, where you see a picture of an offshore grid with both uh, electric transmission, but also uh, transport of hydrogen. And, uh, and this uh, mixed energy system of the future is, is also a key research challenge. Then uh, a very large portion of the global wind resource is at deep sea, which requires uh, floating wind technology. Uh, and within this area, Norway has had a pioneering role with uh, developing the high wind concept, which was the first uh, full-scale floating wind turbine to be installed. It was installed in Norway already in 2009 by Equinor and has been successfully in operation since then. And since then, there's also been developed a few other uh, floating wind farms with that concept and also with other concepts. And this is uh, really an exciting development that I've been uh, happy to follow since the start and, uh, and I'm keen to develop now into uh, something that can be cost competitive with uh, bottom fixed wind turbines and also land-based wind um, in the years to come. And the reason for Norway really to take an interest in this is, is that uh, of course, there is the energy potential, but there is also great opportunities for innovation, uh, job creation and, and export industry. Uh, 
And Norway is not really a big producer of wind turbines, but uh, Norway is producing uh, uh, substructures, uh, installation vessels for wind turbines, and also um, platforms for big HVDC stations and so on. So there's lots of industry interest in that. Next slide, please. So uh, for the research center, we uh, got a lot of interest from, uh, from industry to join. And since they haven't signed the contract yet, they are still uh, to be confirmed. But, uh, but this is uh, more or less the list that, uh, of partners that will join. And I'm also very happy to say that we have uh, associates both from, uh, from UK and Denmark and also uh, so DTU, of course, and Stratclyde in UK. National Renewable Energy Lab and US as uh, associate partners in in the center that will uh, we will have a close collaboration with uh, in the center activity. Next slide, please. So our objective, uh, sort of uh, broadly, is to bring forward outstanding research and innovation to create jobs and grow exports and to facilitate the sustainable development of wind power. Uh, and the latter part is uh, important for the future development of offshore wind, I think. Uh, uh, on land, at least in Norway, we see a big uh, opposition against land-based wind. Uh, it's, uh, Norway was the country in Europe that installed most land-based wind uh, last year. Uh, but there was also lots of protest against that in Norway. And, and now offshore wind is popular and fairly easy to sort of get acceptance for, at least uh, most places in Europe. But uh, I'm quite sure that if we are not taking this seriously, we can, uh, we can get into uh, issues uh, here. And it's really about uh, creating a sustainable development. Next slide, please. So for Northwind to address this, we have put up a research program where we think we can make a substantial difference. And if you take sort of a bird's eye view on this, you know this one thing, we don't focus on the wind turbines themselves. We think that uh, DTU and NREL and and other partners are much better than us on that. So this is not something we uh, address in any detail, but we instead focus on uh, structures and integrity, marine operations and logistics, the electrical infrastructure and system integration. And of course, also digitalization, the digital twin technology and asset management. And, and we pay attention to sustainable wind development. And in, in Northwind, we'll build a research program also uh, closely with uh, UC case studies that will be carried out uh, in close collaboration with the industry partners um, so that they may have a specific uh, case they want to investigate in, in some more detail, uh, maybe quite applied, and then uh, the research partners can join uh, the industry to to solve a certain uh, a challenge, uh, which is more sort of, yeah, uh, of more immediate um, interest. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just uh, two sort of examples of uh, possible use uh, case studies. The one on the left-hand side is a picture of the North Sea um, where you, there are some green uh, squares and these green squares are possible areas for developing offshore wind farms in, in Norway. Um, there are plans to do that. So up to maybe five gigawatt of capacity to develop on, on two of these areas, both with floating wind and, and bottom fixed wind. And uh, in the north wind, we, we plan to work together with the industry to, to do some uh, studies to enable uh, this development. Another issue we will study in, uh, in Northway is to look at how you can develop wind farms in a more sustainable 
way to combine it with fish farms, to combine it, uh, uh, yeah, with other uh, opportunities. So not just look at sort of the downside of installing uh, wind turbines in, uh, in nature or at sea, but really to look at how can we do this in a sustainable way and to find technical solutions basically to uh, to mitigate some of the problems uh, that can be associated with wind uh, development. Next slide, please. And we will of course use our laboratories to uh, to qualify results and uh, and for this we have uh, a fairly big ocean basin 50 times 80 meters uh, wide and 10 meters deep uh, this is where the first high wind turbines uh, were tested in scale and we continue to test turbines uh, floating in the sea uh, in this basin uh, to to qualify the technology we also have uh, radars to uh, to monitor birds and birds mitigation and how they will uh, interact with winter with winter winds and to find solutions for how how to kill less uh, eagles for instance and we have electric technical laboratories to to study uh, cable technologies and breaker technologies and HVDC technologies and and so on and also other laboratories to, to check, for instance, structural integrity of uh, anchor chains for, for floating turbines. Next slide, please. So what we like to achieve is to have a green jobs and export industry uh, to reduce cost of wind energy installations. And, and you asked me about one specific challenge that, that we thought were sort of quite uh, pressing. And I would say, uh, one thing that Northwind will pay much attention to is really on floating wind and to reduce the cost of floating wind uh, so that it becomes cost competitive within the next 10 years. And we think there is really opportunities for that and we will address is, I mean, upscaling of the turbines will help uh, to develop a supply chain to more efficiently produce and manufacture structures will also help. But we also think there are opportunities to to optimize the design of floating wind turbines, going everything from uh, the grid connection of cables, uh, mooring systems, uh, the floater, uh, the way they are installed, and also uh, the way such wind farms are operated. So also on the control system. So that's that's really to increase the efficiency of wind farm operation. I think is is uh, is really an area where uh, there's lots of interesting research to to be done to be done and and where we can achieve great results. And then, of course, to reduce negative environmental impact and improve public acceptance and and general support to UN sustainability goals. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just to tell you a bit how we organize a center like this. As I said, uh, the center will be hosted by um, by Sintef. So Sintef uh, will have sort of the center management, and I will be the center director. But there will be just as in a company, there will be a center board with industry representatives, uh, and we'll also have a general assembly with all the uh, members. And uh, well, we have a scientific advisory committee where DTU and NREL and an associate uh, research partner will uh, um, participate. And we'll also have a technology transfer committee to, to make sure that we communicate results uh, towards the industry and, and uh, take in, uh, promising results out in the industry. Yes, please, next. So, what we aim is to be internationally outstanding together. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I know we are running over time. So Paul, I apologize, but I wanna make sure that um, you have time, Paul, to stay with us for a few minutes to, to talk to us about what NREL is up to. Is, is that okay? Do, do you have a- It's, it's great. I, Excellent, I'm Good. gonna skip the offshore meeting that I have coming up here <laughs> at NREL. And 
<laughs> and just um, one. And uh, you should know also, um, I know uh, not too many people left, but a couple of people left, but we are recording this. So, um, you know, as uh, assuming our speakers are comfortable with that, we will share it. So people had to had to leave or join late. I know a few people joined late as well. So Paul, let me just uh, do you the courtesy of introducing you again, um, because I start, you know, we started earlier, not everyone was on. Um, you are the senior research fellow at Enron uh, and the chief engineer also in the Wind Technology Center. You have a number of other accolades, but I'll, I'll mention one. Um, I believe that the European Academy for Wind Energy awarded you the Scientific Award in 2016 for your leadership. And you are publishing, expect, oh, for, except, uh, for published in scientific publishing, and you received the NREL Chairman's Award for Sustained Research and Excellence in 2018. So um, I just wanted to highlight those. Um, and we'll let you get started. And I think Corey is going to bring up your presentation. So thanks, Corey. Thanks. I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the presentations that have gone before. Uh, I would hate to have shortened any one of them. Uh, Really, uh, really some great stuff. I'll try to move quickly here, perhaps in a little different vein, but talk about NREL. NREL, of course, is uh, a national laboratory, which is part of the Department of Energy system of national laboratories in the United States. There are 17 of them uh, spread across the country. Uh, NREL is the only one devoted to transforming energy. That is our, our key mission. So the next slide just kind of shows that uh, we do have a wind energy element in that. Transforming energy really uh, is about energy generation, energy efficiency, uh, transportation, and also system integration of, of these energy systems. And within the, the wind energy, we're part of generation. And within the generation from wind, the offshore wind is, is a critical element uh, in the US. Uh, the next slide shows that uh, we've had a shift in the US recently. There's been a change of administration. Uh, the new administration has come in with some very aggressive goals for decarbonizing the sector. And they're promising to, to provide uh, carbon-free electricity in the U.S. by 2035 and, and a net zero greenhouse gas energy systems um, by 2050, uh, both of which will require transforming the energy system. So it's a very exciting time to be at the laboratory uh, where our mission is directly uh, tied to some major goals uh, of the new administration. The next slide shows a little bit about why we think wind is a critical part. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're estimating that out of this electrical supply for the U.S., wind could supply about half of that. And the, the reason is the, the resource is tremendous. We've got, uh, you know, excluding all the land where it can't be developed, excluding everything that's not uh, really a viable wind development site. There's still uh, 10 terawatts uh, of wind available uh, within the U.S. and about 20% of that is offshore. And the offshore wind is critical because if you look at the load um, areas and the areas of high urban development and high loads, uh, they are on the coasts. So de delivering the wind uh, from the areas where the resource is tremendous to the places where the load is demanding it will require a substantial development of offshore wind, even though we expect the land-based wind to be uh, really high as well. We currently have about um, 120 gigawatts of wind installed nationally, and almost none of that is offshore at this point. But we have some, some very uh, aggressive goals for going offshore very quickly. The next slide shows what some of the development areas look like in the United States. The, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, or BOEM, as we call it, has designated a number of wind energy uh, call areas. A call area is, is an area of uh, the ocean where they begin some more detailed investigations and uh, looking at the environmental impacts and all of the uh, elements of, of development. And from those call areas, after the studies have gone uh, further, uh, they will carve out some uh, uh, areas to be bid out for development, and those are lease areas. So you'll see a combination of the two, some areas that have already gone into the through the process of a call area and are now being leased, and you'll see individual developers are, are um, have, have won bids uh, to develop those areas, and then there are still about uh, 13 call areas designated around the country. Not, they're not all in this photo. The East Coast is, is the primary uh, objective right now, but there are five of them in the Pacific, three in California 
and, and uh, two in Hawaii. So the next slide shows a little bit about why we think the East Coast is, is, is attractive. Some years ago, we did some studies uh, looking at the cost of development and the cost of energy that would be uh, derived um, at that point in time. So these are a little old, the numbers are not really relevant, but really the, the direction and the trends are, are really what's important. And the East Coast uh, at that point uh, had a lot of areas that were very expensive, the red areas and the uh, green areas were attractive at, uh, currently. And as the technology develops, as the cost of the, the um, hardware goes down and as the uh, port facilities and construction facilities are enhanced, those costs can continue to come down to where more and more of that area becomes cost effective. You can start to move into areas that don't quite have the perfect resource, don't quite have the perfect access to ports, and they will begin to be more attractive for development areas in the future. The, uh, of course, this is critically dependent on that resource. And uh, the next slide shows a little bit about how we're beginning to look at this in a more comprehensive way. We can't get measurement devices out at every place in the ocean to make direct measurements. So there's a lot of dependence on the computational models that we've got. These uh, wharf models that calculate the atmospheric flows, calculate the wind speeds in real time over long periods of time. We've started to look at long duration simulations to try to calculate actual real time um, uh, wind speeds at uh, specific elevations of interest for wind development and doing that over larger and larger um, spans of the, of the globe so that we get rid of boundary effects and have a more accurate uh, calculation result. So we've been using these to push forward the development in the, in the East Coast and improve what we have. A lot of this data is going into what's called the wind toolkit, which is a massive database of real-time um, wind speeds at the development areas and at heights of interest. The next slide goes to the Pacific. And there you can see it's really a different story. The, uh, the current cost of energy there is looking quite high because there is essentially no shallow water at all uh, on the Pacific. So all of the development we're looking there is, is floating. So to have John uh, talk about how important floating technology is in Norway, it's really similar uh, in, in our West Coast. Uh, but we do expect that the cost of those floating systems should come down. The development of ports and ability to, to deploy those floating systems should come down. So over time, it looks like there could be some, uh, some development in the West Coast as well. Again, critically dependent on the state of uh, floating uh, technology. That West Coast, the next slide shows, is interesting for other reasons. Um, it's not just the total amount of electricity that you can generate, but how that electricity integrates into the grid. We have started looking at some of the capacity credit uh, of wind across the United States using the wind toolkit data, looking at the time of day and season of year delivery of the wind energy and looking at how that matches the demands of the grid. And it turns out that uh, the capacity credit, which is a, a metric for that, that match, um, is very high in the offshore winds in the Pacific, especially Northern California and Oregon, but really across, across the entire coastline. Uh, there's a much higher capacity match for the grid in the Western US than you would get on land anywhere, say, east of the Great Plains, where you start to see higher capacity credits again. So it's not, not just that the costs um, have to come down, but that value is very high. And of course, that depends on delivering that electricity from where it is uh, to the load centers as well. And transmission in, on the West Coast is, is critically important as well. So the next slide kind of gives a, a hint at some of the technology innovation uh, that we're looking at. I think some of these were shown before. Uh, we have a, our one concept that we're looking at ourselves. Uh, there's a Steesdall Tetraspar concept. The idea being though, that uh, if we simply take the uh, floating technology that, that oil and gas has used, uh, concepts that they've found very effective, they tend to use a lot of material. They're very steel intensive or concrete in some cases. 
And there has to be a better way, a better pathway to a low cost than to simply use those designs that depend on lots and lots of steel. So these designs are riskier, they're not tried, um, but they do offer some pathways that we think can get to very, very low cost of floating offshore technology. And hopefully we can get to even lower cost floating technology than we now have with bottom mount. I think the opportunity is there. Next slide shows some of the dependence that we have in making innovations. We're always dependent on the design tools that we have in place. And the major initiative that has gone directly at improving the, the accuracy of our design tools is through the IEA wind, where the OC3, OC4 through OC6 efforts have brought together a multinational collaborative, uh, dozens of members, including industry, to all bring their design capabilities to bear on the, the offshore uh, world. And the idea is that the validated tools will enable us to, to uh, enhance the technology innovation. Next slide shows uh, an area that we've looked at, especially at DOE and at NREL, is to look at the computational assets. There's been an explosion in capability in terms of being able to do large scale fluid dynamics calculations on, on uh, computer systems. In fact, the new generation of computer systems is being built right now in the Department of Energy laboratory system. Those are exascale computers. We've gone up from petascale, we're going up another uh, factor of a thousand up to the exascale level of computers, and they can do some of these multi physics, uh, multi scale computations all in one place to remove some of those uh, uncertainties. So we're looking at uh, that exawind exa uh, capability that we've developed. It can do uh, the flow through rotors, tracking their wakes and looking at interactions of wakes in a, in a plant, or it can look at the surface of the ocean, look at that interaction between waves and winds. Now those codes are so big that they are unlikely to be used for design purposes. I would say they're not, but they offer us a pathway to examine areas of physics that are hard to measure and hard to get to. And we can take the understanding from these tools with artificial intelligence, machine learning kinds of concepts and, uh, and bring them into the design tool world. So we can bring the high fidelity into the mid fidelity application and improve our design tools it, with the workhorse tools that we use. So my, my last slide kind of gives a sense then, uh, and I think Ignacio may have shown something similar, where at the right-hand side, we apply the highest fidelity uh, capabilities that we have to understand what's really going on within those systems, both at the individual turbine level, which means the rotor, but also what's underwater, but also at the wind plant level, where each turbine is creating wakes and is impacting the rest of the, of the turbines. And at the left-hand side, we have the simplest models possible, where we try to look at design exploration, we look at optimization of a concept, and we can go through conceptual studies with things that are very simple. And then in the middle is really the workhorse. Those are the tools that we need to apply to the design of offshore systems to bring the costs out, to deal with uncertainties, and to really uh, drive down cost of the whole system. So that was kind of a, a galloping uh, course through what, what we're doing, but I hope that's useful. Uh, the last slide is just a, a wrap up. I can turn it back to Carrie and let you get to some of your questions. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I know from our own experience working with NREL that you all have so much going on, both in terms of the breadth of topics you're looking at and the depth of work that you're doing. So I think your presentation only hinted at some of that, but um, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot going on at NREL as well, and as and I said, we really um, we benefit so much from working with you all uh, and trying to connect connect the work that we do and sponsor some of the work that you're doing. Um, so we did get a few questions. I know we're running very late. Let me just ask a couple of those. Um, it strikes me, uh, based on what I heard today, that um, we definitely could. And maybe we will do some sort of follow up where we have more of a dialogue about uh, what we're working on, because um, I think um, 
uh, how do I put it, um, setting a baseline of, of common knowledge was really, really helpful today, but uh, we do have a lot of questions and uh, both from our audience and, and I know from my own team. So um, we'll, th we'll think about doing that. I think it could be really helpful if, if you'd all be interested. But first, um, before, before we go, let me ask a couple questions. Um, one came in, um, and this is for anyone, and maybe we'll just do quick two, two answers and then we'll move to the next question so that we can kind of wrap up for folks. Was, is anyone um, looking at decommissioning or uh, repowering? And this is probably more for Europe where systems have been installed for a little bit longer or the UK um, for a much longer actually. Um, is, is there any decommissioning or uh, end of life cycle work or research going on um, and how to best do that? I don't know if Deborah or any one of you could, could jump in on that if you know of any work being done in that area. Mm -hmm. I can comment uh, quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have had a, recently there was a project that Finnish was called LifeWind that was um, exploring the opportunities for life extension. Then of course it was not focused exclusive. I mean, not focused on the, the commissioning itself, but it was. I mean, life extension was compared to the commissioning, as um, in terms of assessing what is the best uh, strategy. And it depends on, um, yeah, it depends on the, uh, basically you need to assess what is the remaining life, uh, be able to assess for, for critical components in your wind farm. And then you can take a decision. Is it still profitable to extend life? What are the implications in terms of O&M cost, et cetera? Or do you go for, for the commissioning? This is the closest we've been to the commissioning. Mm -hmm. okay. Any, anyone else have experience they care to share or? Um, yeah, I think um, <clears throat> certainly something that's on the on the agenda of something that needs to be looked at. Um, we have some um, one of our flexible fund projects is looking at recycling of blades, um, but uh, that yeah, that's as far as we, we've got really so far. Great. And uh, maybe uh, you can another one. It is uh, the, in the, on the IA on the International Energy Agency. And the group on, on wind energy, it has started now a new research task on recycling that could be also interesting for uh, yeah. if, if someone is interested on, on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Paul, uh, this is mostly for you. Um, maybe you could speak very quickly to, has, uh, one of the questions is, has there, what have the learnings been from the, really the Block Island project. Do we have any good takeaways from that project yet, which is really the one major demonstration project here in the US? Oh my gosh, thanks for the uh, one question I really can't answer. I, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I know very little of it's coming out there, but it, it is certainly just a huge, a huge step to get, get hardware in the water yes. and to get people oh. seeing it and, and to have that, that going on. I think they've had you know, some, some fits and starts with their connection. I think it, it kind of raised the issue that our electrical systems, you know, are going to be critically important, and um, uh, it, it does point to the the need to make sure that that, that is um, well designed and, and and well laid up. Uh, I think the experience has been very good. The machines are operating. Uh, it's just really a good uh, first step uh, to mm -hmm. get that in. But yeah. as far as specific learning, I haven't I have not heard a lot. Yeah, that's a great, um, it brings to mind something I've been thinking more about. Um, you know, there's, as many of you know, there's quite a bit of work uh, going up in the Gulf of Maine with the University of Maine and their research array, proposed research array. But there has been additional conversation about, um, you know, uh, having a test facility array that's actually connected to the grid. So um, we can actually test a number of different things. Um, whether they relate, you know, to just the structure itself or actually, you know, some a grid device or what have you. So in any case, I've, I've highlighted that as something that would be great to have, um, but we need it soon, you know, for it to be uh, really helpful and useful uh, in the U.S. So. And, I, and I agree with that as well, Carrie. I mean, that's, that's a point that we've made as well and are trying to make uh, that if you want to make progress quickly, you've got to be able to field equipment and get good measurements and you need a facility that's ready to go. Yeah. So I, I would just agree with that completely. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I could add that in Norway, we have a test station for floating uh, turbines. Uh, so where the Stihl project is, is being tested and also the European flagship project is tested. Yeah. And we will also have uh, installations there to test uh, 
electrical connections and so on. I, I was going to ask, John, are those, are those actually interconnected to the grid? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So um, maybe I'll give you each a chance if you have any other comment. I, I don't want to keep people too long. We've already 20 minutes past, but um, we still have a number of people on. Does anyone want to give, um, you know, a final uh, remark or anything? Or you're, you're more than welcome to before we wrap up. Um, I don't know, Deborah. I'll, I'll start with you. Any any final kind of last words? Um, yeah, I'll just say thank you. Thank you so much for for inviting me. It's really interesting to see um, the other presentations and and to work together. I think and, and talk about these these issues. You know, for us, uh, floating offshore wind has always been the big the big challenge when we started um, the the hub. We're now moving more into working um, to thinking about. Um, integration of offshore wind so you know the ambition of the UK government has, has grown over the last few very very recently um, and so thinking about yeah integration um, is, is a key thing and working with uh, other other disciplines in networks and um, other um, other other sort of energy vectors as well great so, yeah thank you very much yeah sure uh, Paul do you want to go next and uh... I would just say, you know, and it's come in these, these, these presentations, we, we as engineers, we, we use the best information we've got and we design systems that function and we allow margins to take care of things that we don't know about. I think as, in, as Ignacio you know, said in his presentation, there are, there are huge uncertainties and there's a lot we don't know about the atmosphere over the water, about the machines themselves that are now so big, we can't even test the airfoils in wind tunnels because the Reynolds numbers can't be matched. And, and the electrical systems that we're projecting are going to run with uh, you know, inertialess connections to the grid that have not been explored you know, in, in, in the magnitude that we're talking about here. So I think there is a huge need to understand at a fundamental level, a lot of the physical processes that we're doing. So we don't add cost and conservatism right. and, and buffers uh, but are actually designing with, with good knowledge about what's really going on. I think that's fundamental. John or Ignacio? Yeah, John. I go. think what Paul said was uh, so well uh, formulated that I don't want to uh, try to do anything <laughs> than just to say this was really excellent to, to the point. Um, I would say that uh, if I should add something, I would say that uh, in addition to these uh, maybe three challenges that you uh, suggested, Paul, I would say you can apply this then to, to floating wind in particular as a, one of the big challenges for the future. Mm. Looking at my screen. Maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe, uh, of course, I mean, it is a... Um, I think it has been very well said also. I completely agree with Paul and, and, and the other comments. I also think it is um, there is plenty of, of of research and knowledge to be acquired. Still, completely agree, and I would like to point at the, maybe still the fact that uh, I like to see wind energy as a community somehow, right? The research community, of course, and then the industry now is really big. It's getting really big, but we still have, or maybe I still have, the feeling of a community, meaning that. Um, the more we interact, the more we collaborate, the more we help each other, then the, 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 the better results we will have, definitely. I think this is also the history of wind energy where there has been a lot of collaboration, a lot of um, uh, people working together really to, to get knowledge, to validate tools, to go through uh, problems and issues and obstacles. And I think that it is a really successful story that the, the one we have seen over the last, whatever, 30 years or something like that. So let's keep that spirit uh, for the future, for the next years to come, because that will be the success of wind energy as well. So I think we have a, an excellent opportunity now also to join forces with a renovated enthusiasm from the US, which is fantastic. So let's aim at, at that. I couldn't have scripted that ending better myself. So thank you so much. I mean, that that was really the, the impetus for today's conversation. So um Thank you for those remarks. I think that's a, a great way to think about it. So I just, I thank you all um, for taking the time today, taking the extra time to, um, I'll be back in touch because I, I think it's worth, um, you know, having another conversation where we dive a little bit deeper, maybe into some of our topics um, and, and provide an opportunity for folks that might not be in a conversation with you every day among the institutions, but the broader audience to hear 
about how um, some of these things interconnect and how we might work together. So thanks, thank you all. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, please look for our announcements next week on the awards we are about to make uh, and, and Offshore Wind and our symposium later this year, will you hear a much more detail about some of the things that um, NREL is working on that are funded by us and some of our other projects. So thanks everyone. Have a great uh, day or evening as the case may be. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Jane.